Well, as I spoke with different people in our community this week post-election, it became ever more apparent just how varied we are as a community. So how are you? I have noticed that for some, this was just another week. For some, there is a feeling of, of, of victory, of, of, of hope, of joy. And for others, there is a sense of grief, there is fear, there is a sense of loss. One of the privileges of serving alongside you all here is that this happens to be a community of people who fall into all of those categories. And I believe that that diversity of perspective, of viewpoints, is a powerful quality that we possess. But it also means that, that we need to be intentional about making space for one another, recognizing that, of course, God is neither red nor blue, but that is, it is in earnestly seeking to, to do God's will together that we make space for one another. I've heard a few different pastors articulate this following point in, in one way or another in the past weeks, and, and that is that the reality of the reality that whether you fall on that spectrum, where, excuse me, wherever you fall on that spectrum post-election, that our call as followers of Jesus Christ remains the same, that we're called to, to stand with the poor. We're called to care for the oppressed and the downtrodden. We're called to stand with the marginalized. We're called to pray for our leaders. And we're called to love self-sacrificially. And as it did last week, our scripture for this morning again comes to us at just the right time. This morning, we'll continue our journey through the book of Ruth and move into chapter 2. And so I, I invite you to, to get your Bibles out that you brought with you from home or your pew Bibles as you prepare to turn there. But, but I want to review just for a moment where we've been. Last week, we read about this family from Bethlehem, a, a wife and a husband, Naomi and Elimelech. They have two sons, and together they travel, they leave Bethlehem because there is a famine in their hometown, and they go out in search of a place where they might find the sustenance they need to survive. And so this family of four, they move to the country of Moab, a country whose people had routinely served as antagonists in the history thus far of the people of Israel. It's it's not a place that we would expect this Israelite family to go. And shortly after their arrival in Moab, Elimelech, Naomi's husband, dies. And the two sons, they marry Moabite women, and after some years go by, these two sons die, leaving the mother, Naomi, with her two daughters-in-law, Orpah, and Ruth. Naomi hears that there is food once again back home in Bethlehem, and she makes the decision to go back home. But she encourages her two daughters-in-law, Orpah and Ruth, to, to go back to their homes, go back to their own cultural safety nets, go back to their families. She encourages them, start over, find other husbands. 
Orpah chooses to do so understandably, but it's in this moment when Ruth communicates to Naomi her commitment to walking alongside her, whatever may come. Rather than returning to the safety net of her own childhood household, Ruth commits to traveling back to Bethlehem with Naomi. And today in chapter two, we find Ruth and Naomi together back in Bethlehem with no income, looking for ways to provide for themselves. And so it is that we find Ruth and Naomi depending on one of the social safety nets provided for in the Torah, here in the book of Deuteronomy. And so if you look in Deuteronomy chapter 24, you find a number of provisions, ways of providing for the poor and the immigrant. We find their instruction that describes that, that day laborers should be paid before the sun goes down because they depend on this income. We, we find their instruction with regards to how immigrants are to be treated, and there is instruction to farmers that they're not to go back to the field after their initial harvest. The scripture says that they're to leave that grain, those olives, the grapes that were missed in the initial harvest, they're to leave those for the poor and the immigrant. And this practice is referred to as gleaning, this practice of going back over the field if you were an outsider if you were on the margins of society. And that's what we find Ruth doing today. She is out in the field during harvest time, trusting in this provision in a culture and faith that is not her own. And we find her gleaning in a field belonging to a man by the name of Boaz. According to the scripture, Boaz is a man of, of means and also happens to, to be in the same family or related to uh, Naomi's late husband, Elimelech. Now, when I was growing up, for one reason or another, my mother had a canary named Boaz. <laughs> That's not who we're talking about here. <laughs> but I can't help but read that name without seeing a small little yellow singing bird. Our text for today says that Boaz sees a woman working in his fields. And he doesn't recognize her, and he asks one of the farmhands about her. He says, who is this woman? Presumably, she, she looks different than the other women. She perhaps is even dressed differently. She's clearly an outsider. When have you experienced what it's like to be an outsider. What was that like? How did you know? We're acutely aware when we are an outsider, aren't we? Boaz, on the other hand, Boaz here in this community is an insider, and not only is he an insider, he, he's a person of power, of, of means, of influence in this particular group. What are those places where you are an insider? What does that feel like? How do you know What we will witness this morning in our scripture is this interaction between two people. One, an outsider, an immigrant, and one, an insider, a person of power and influence in this town of Bethlehem. And what we'll discover in the interaction between these two is a model, 
a model for what it can look like for those who are on the inside to reach a hand out to those on the outside. And, and, it's also a model for what it can look like for an outsider to proceed faithfully because it seems to require activity in both directions for the engagement to be fruitful. And so now, we'll read from Ruth chapter two, beginning at verse eight, just as Boaz approaches Ruth. Then Boaz said to Ruth, now listen, my daughter, do not go glean in another field or leave this one, but keep close to my young women. Keep your eyes on the field that is being reaped and follow behind them. I have ordered the young men not to bother you. If you get thirsty, go to the vessels and drink from what the young men have drawn. And then Ruth fell prostrate with her face to the ground and said to him, Why have I found favor in your sight that you should take notice of me when I am a foreigner? But Boaz answered her, All that you have done for your mother-in-law since the death of your husband has been fully told me, and how you left your father and mother and your native land and came to a people that you did not know before. May the Lord reward you for your deeds, and may you have a full reward from the Lord, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come for refuge. And then she said, May I continue to find favor in your sight, my Lord, for you have comforted me and spoken kindly to your servant, even though I am not one of your servants. At mealtime, Boaz said to her, Come here and, and eat some of this bread and dip your morsel in the sour wine. And so she sat beside the reapers, and he heaped up for her some parched grain. She ate until she was satisfied, and she had some left over. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. In this exchange, we see Boaz doing or, or exhibiting, I think, two kinds of behaviors. We find Boaz both asserting his authority and humbling himself. These, these two seemingly paradoxical behaviors. First, he, he uses his authority to, to make a place for her. He uses his authority to, to ensure her safety. He uses his authority to communicate to her welcome. But I want to be sure that we don't overlook his behavior at the mealtime. And it's one that's easy to miss. At the mealtime, Boaz serves her. Something that would have been countercultural, it would have been typical for the woman to serve the man here, and yet, here, not in a private way, not as a way of, of sharing intimacy, but rather in a very public way, demonstrating his own humility and setting an example for all of the other workers to see Boaz serves Ruth. And in doing, presents to us what it looks like for an insider to reach out, both asserting authority and publicly humbling himself. But Ruth, Ruth acts also in the story. 
Ruth shows up. We, we have no reason to believe, if you read the scripture carefully, that Ruth knows whose field this is. And though we are aware, as the audience, that Boaz is a kinsman to Elimelech, the text does not lead us to believe that Ruth is aware that this particular field belongs to Boaz. Ruth simply seeks to to understand a a cultural provision, this right that she has to glean, and, and she trusts it. Friends, think of what a risky move this would have been. This is bold action that Ruth takes. Well, sure, it says in the Torah that this is how a landowner is supposed to behave, what the landowner is supposed to allow, but but the entire Old Testament, the Hebrew Bible, is the story of God's people not doing what Scripture instructs that they are to do. Ruth acts boldly on faith, with faith, both in this prescribed cultural way and with faith in this particular person, this person whom she does not know. Friends, this is bold action that Ruth takes. And yet, when she is approached by Boaz and he extends an arm of welcome, she is also deferential. She expresses gratitude, and in doing, she creates the context for further conversation. It is, it is both at the same time. Ruth is both bold and deferential. So often, I think that acting boldly is confused with acting badly. Ruth's measured wise approach serves as a model for what it can look like for us to act in a way that may bring about the change that we're seeking when we are on the outside. And I think what we find here in both of these characters is a model for us as we seek to be the church in this community, in this country, that is divided. I was listening to a podcast just a couple of weeks ago. It's Kerry Newhoff Leadership Podcast. I'd recommend it. He's a former Presbyterian pastor who welcomes on a a breadth of different guests. This particular guest was the English theologian N.T. Wright. And N.T. Wright was was asked about the current political climate and how and how he thought about that in light of the promises of the kingdom of God we read in Scripture. And Wright made this statement that the gospel the gospel transforms the world not by force. That rather, God seeks to transform the world, he says, neither through the right nor the left, not by dictate nor sheer determination, but by love. By love. Love as seen in Jesus on the cross. Self giving, self sacrificial love. And friends, quite frankly, I think if we're honest, this is not how we expect change to occur. We expect it to occur from top down, by by dictate. The gospel, friends, is paradoxical. Because it is this self-giving, self-sacrificial love that creates 
change and transformation, not from the top down, but from the bottom up through the lives of of real people. Personal stories like the ones we find here of Ruth and Boaz. Personal stories like yours and mine. Friends, it's our responsibility, the responsibility of we, the people, to care for and stand alongside the oppressed and the downtrodden. Friends, if you're feeling this week like you've won something, then I would say it's incumbent upon you to love self-sacrificially, to to assert any authority that you may have for the work of Jesus Christ in the world, caring for the marginalized, the poor, caring for those who today are feeling like they are on the outside, caring for those who are in fear, for those who feel like the world is coming apart. It's incumbent upon you to assert your authority the way the powers, excuse me, not the way the powers of this world assert authority, but rather as Jesus Christ asserts authority by giving himself away. And today, this week, if if you are feeling despondent, fear, hopelessness, then our story today calls for you to act both boldly and deferentially, which is another hard and challenging call. Our scripture today calls for this paradoxical engagement, trusting that this is the way the kingdom of God transforms the world. It is through death that we find true life. Friends, as as you look at the vote in this country, it's split in half. You can keep your blue maps and your red maps. I'm not interested in seeing them. We're talking about 47.5% and 50.5%. And I get excited because this is the opportunity for this church to be this place of Christ-centered connection that's led by the gospel, that seeks to reach out its hands one to another to create opportunities for real and meaningful conversation where we might bring about the kind of change that the gospel promises. Not because it makes sense up here, but because we have faith in a God that seeks to give God's self away. In the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, gracious and holy God, we give you thanks that you are faithful. We ask that you would work through we, your people, broken as we may be, that you would inspirit us. And Lord, that you would transform us. Amen.